I'm here to continue the discussion about the next Camerata Pacifica program, which has also roused a lot of interest. Just in this morning's LA Times, Mark Swed called it politically daring. But is it politically daring? In it, we present John Harbison's cello sonata, Abu Ghraib, and two pieces for string quartet and pre-recorded sound by Michael Doherty, Sing Sing J. Edgar Hoover, and Paul Robeson told me. Then John Cage's iconic four minutes and 33 seconds. And the second half will be Beethoven's second Razumovsky string quartet. It was 59, number two. It's a provocative program for sure, and I programmed it intentionally to be provocative. But political? Is it political because we're presenting it today in this environment of, of heightened awareness of women's marches and FBI investigations? If so, I programmed it two years ago. So how do we reconcile that? I traveled to the East Coast and um, met with Michael and John to discuss these issues of, of the mu their music and what's behind it and the idea of the artist as a uh, political activist. By the way, I apologize for my East Coast cold that I had uh, and you'll hear coughing and sniffling throughout. So over the next weeks, I'll share those interviews with you. But in today's video, John and Michael will discuss the origins of their pieces. As the curator of this program, I want to say that this is not a political statement. I'm not advocating one position over another. I'm not saying one should be progressive in one's outlook or, or liberal or conservative. But what I am saying is we have these composers. John Harbison, Michael Doherty, and Beethoven, separated by centuries, but all acknowledged as very substantial artists. And this is what they've chosen to say. What do you make of that? That's what this program is about. I think it's remarkable that this is part of the canon. I think it's remarkable that when I go into my collection of repertoire, this is there. Why is it there? Why was this written? Artists really mostly come eventually to the principle that they, they write the pieces that, that uh, are necessary for them to write, you know. I, I almost go further than that. I'd say, if you can't talk yourself out of writing it, you'll write it. Mm -hmm. you no, know, you you resist doing really subject matter that that seems uh, to be infected by a huge amount of discomfort and and inhumane behavior. But eventually, it's not possible to, to resist doing that. Um, and I think that's that's kind of the rule. I mean, could could the artist have chosen not to do this? Well, uh, that's usually a good test whether people will will uh, at least listen to it, give it a listen. Well, I I was never a fan of J. Ed, Edgar Hoover, who was the director of the FBI for forty years and and, and reigned terror among anybody he came in contact with. And, uh, you know, the idea that uh, he could uh, pretty much at, at will wiretap or uh, blackmail anybody he wanted to uh, politically, uh, I thought it was fascinating that he was able to hold on to power for so many years. Mm -hmm. And I grew up during the 60s where many of his victims, uh, from Martin Luther King to the Kennedys to, uh, you know, uh, Elvis Presley, I mean, uh, to the Beatles, anybody who was a, a person of importance, uh, and in popular culture was seen as an enemy. We've heard the word recently, you know, the press being an enemy of the American people. These are words that Hoover used to say. His famous saying, the FBI is as close to you as your nearest telephone. When I was going to write the piece, the, F uh, the uh, National Archives had just released, uh, made public all the recordings to J. Edgar Hoover that he'd made in his office. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, speeches and also private uh, tapes. They were the tapes that, uh, that I, I got copies of and I had to listen, go to this dark room in the National Archives and they gave me these boxes of real, real tapes and I would listen to them, oh, I'll, I'll take a copy of that one and so forth. And mm -hmm. I came back to Ann Arbor, I was able to splice together his voice actually mm -hmm. as a confessional talking about how he wiretapped people. So what makes it eerie is you actually hear his voice. Right. And I came across an amazing uh, recording of him singing, singing the national anthem at an American Legion uh, meeting uh, back in the 50s. So you actually hear at the end the Star Spangled Banner with J. Edgar Hoover singing the Star Spangled Banner. Paul Robeson was one of the victims of Hoover. Basically, mm -hmm. J. Edgar Hoover ruined his life. Paul Robeson was the, let's say, the Denzel Washington of his time. Mm -hmm. A famous uh, figure. He was a film star. He was a Broadway star. He, a credible singer. Uh, but he was also very active in, in, in politics, especially with uh, uh, rights for African Americans. Mm -hmm. And so uh, he uh, made the unfortunate connection with Russia. He went over to Russia after the Second World War and became kind of a, a, a a big uh, hero in Russia mm -hmm. um, and was asked to sing. He often sang uh, for Russian did, uh, you know, concerts with, with thousands of people and, and he actually sang Russian communist songs mm -hmm. as well in his concert along with you know, spirituals and so forth. But he was definitely seen by Hoover as, as an enemy of the United States and so later on in his life his passport was revoked. He was uh, you know, constantly hounded. He was, <laughs> he was a blackmailed, he was wiretapped, uh, he was seen as a pariah of uh, American culture in the end of his life. It was actually very, quite, quite sad. So here you had this figure who was, you know, an amazing actor, singer, um, um, an important figure in America who basically through Hoover was, his career was ruined. Mm -hmm. I didn't think it was off base in my relationship to my listener that we could say, let's think about torture. Mm -hmm. how, how do we feel about it? Russia. Some people, uh, more than uh, at th th that time, now seem to speak of it as productive. The first task is to write a good piece and, um, <clears throat> you know, to somehow make a musical statement which wouldn't be there but for its, uh, its concentration on a certain uh, dramatic situation. Um, and uh, in the case of this piece, um, I, I really felt that part of the um, part of the piece was about a kind of grief. I, the piece had to start with something that I was interested in trying to portray musically: uh, the I, the idea of wrongness. That is, uh, that something is outside of the norm of behavior. In this case, it's musical behavior, but that is an analogy to to personal behavior. So there's a lot of the early part of the piece, um, the two instruments uh, seem to be following a similar trajectory, but they seem to be constantly stepping on the wrong, uh, some, somehow on the wrong terrain. Mm -hmm. um, and that was hard to do, something that interested me to do. Um, and that really be would be the first half of each movement, mm -hmm. is a kind of portrayal of a situation in which something has really been allowed to go uh, out, out of line. Mm -hmm. um, and the second half, I felt like both the cases, with both movements, my, my uh, procedure was to look at uh, can we grieve this and we, can we somehow uh, reassure or at least assure ourselves that that isn't what we are. I didn't feel that I was trying to preach or convince anyone. It was a statement that I was making uh, about a very important event. I wanted to write the piece because I thought the event had been passed over. Uh, and very much at the time, I think this was rather close to the reports, considering what I felt to be the enormity of the uh, of this set of circumstances, that is the, the revelation that we were as a country uh, condoning and, in fact, endorsing torture as a way of dealing with prisoners, that I felt this was a shocking change in the, in the basic traditions of the country, and that, that something as large as that was not really registering with the greater part of the public. Mm -hmm. um, so I really wanted, I just I wanted another occasion 
for, uh, obviously within a fairly restricted set of circumstances, for people to think about what had happened. Um, and I also felt that I was thinking about it. Uh, probably I felt uh, in a way that I would uh, like to deal with as an artist. The first half of the program will be performed uh, without pause. And the audience will be asked not to applaud in between the pieces. And directly after uh, the string quartet plays, Paul Robeson told me, it'll go straight into four minutes and 33 seconds. Four minutes and 33 seconds is famous, and famously mocked as a piece of non-music, usually by people who have no comprehension of its context. I am a Cage fan. I believe he was hugely important to the American musical and, and greater arts scene. John Cage's father, also John Cage, was an inventor adored by his son, who apparently inherited his need for invention. Perhaps my devotion to experimental music, he said, came from my being the son of an inventor. This is key to understanding Cage's work. It is experimental. It is a process of discovery. Cage was concerned that what most people listened to was not sound, but the organization of sounds. He grappled with issues of subjectivity and continuity, and he sought to liberate his music from those constraints. Experimenting with silence, he refrained from writing an all-silent piece, thinking that he wouldn't be taken seriously, quite accurately. But earlier in 1952, which is the year of four minutes and 33 seconds, he wrote a solo piano piece, three and a half minutes long, called Waiting. And the opening, the start of the piece, was a minute and a half of silence. And the conclusion of the piece was another 20 seconds of silence. His inspiration to, to finally write an all-silent piece was when he saw Robert Rauschenberg's all-white paintings, which Rauschenberg said, express the plastic fullness of nothing. David Tudor, the pianist who premiered 4 minutes and 33 seconds, called it one of the most intense listening experiences you can have. You really listen. You're hearing everything there is. What most of the audience experienced as silence, said Cage, were the ambient sounds they ignored, including the interesting sounds they made themselves when they talked or walked out. Cage taught us there was no difference between musical and non-musical sounds. The only difference between sound and silence is the lack of intention to listen. Music is continuous. It is only we who turn away. In programming this work, after the intensity of the first three pieces, I'm interested not only in what you hear within the hall and hear around you. Well, I'm interested in what you hear within your head. For the second half, I wanted to program something that would be more familiar to everybody, yet not lose track of the intent of the program. Beethoven was my only choice, and middle period Beethoven at that. One of Beethoven's 21st century problems is that his music has become so familiar that its revolutionary impact has been considerably diminished. Consider this string quartet from 1806, his heroic period, when single-handedly he's changing the direction of classical music. Consider too, this is post-Enlightenment Europe, flush with the ideals of the French Revolution that are sweeping, well, the world. And this is Europe in the midst of war, one year after the premiere of his third symphony, the Eroica Symphony, originally dedicated to Napoleon Bonaparte. At that time, says Ferdinand Ries, a close companion to the composer, Beethoven had the highest esteem for him and compared him to the greatest consuls of ancient Rome. Not only I, but many of Beethoven's closer friends saw this symphony on his table beautifully copied in manuscript with the word Bonaparte inscribed at the very top of the title page, and Luigi van Beethoven at the very bottom. I was the first to tell him the news that Bonaparte had declared himself emperor, whereupon he broke into a rage and exclaimed, 
So he is no more than a common mortal. Now too he will tread underfoot all the rights of man, indulge only his ambition. Now he will think himself superior to all men, become a tyrant. And he savagely scrubbed the dedication from the title page. This is the time of the second Razumovsky string quartet, the chamber music analog of the Eroica. Just listen to those opening chords. In this music, this statement, political or otherwise, the tension is contained within the form, within the writing. And at this concert, by the time you get to the Beethoven, you will be in a state of such heightened awareness, you will hear his music as you never before have. Well, Beethoven thought and talked about politics more than almost any composer, mm -hmm. but, but he was tremendously optimistic, I mean, by nature. I mean, his whole idea was that uh, real enlightenment idea that we were marching gradually forward towards a more just society. Mm -hmm. And he had this amazing sort of socialist ideas that, you know, instead of people making more money than others, the ones who had much would all just go in and sort of make donations. People right. who had less would all come in and just take what they need. That's that's always appealed to me right. immensely about his character. It was very, in a way, naive. But uh, I think what he saw when he reacted specifically to politics, usually in protest against somebody who was going bad, who was turning into a mm -hmm. dictator or something like that, uh, I think one of the reasons that he always inspires is that he totally believed this. Right. He was a really genuine intellectual. He read a lot. He mm -hmm. thought about what great sort of thinkers had said about these things. And out of all this, he came to very, very consistent conclusions, which is why the characteristic Beethoven uh, deep sort of troubling thing goes towards apotheosis. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's so different from what we hear in, in say, the end of some Mahler symphonies where right. you kind of plunge off the edge. Okay. Uh, Beethoven does have it simply refuses to do that. Uh, and of course that's one of the reasons that he's one of the people we uh, continue to need to hear.